My brother stole my wife, then needed me to save his life, but some betrayals can't be forgiven. I, 32M, have had a complicated relationship with my younger brother Tom, 29M, for the past few years, though that's putting it mildly. Growing up, we were inseparable despite our age difference. Our parents weren't wealthy, but they worked hard to give us a good life in our small town. Dad worked as an accountant, and Mom taught at the local elementary school. They always emphasized the importance of family and looking out for each other. Tom was born when I was three, and from the moment he came home from the hospital, I took my role as his big brother seriously. I walked him to school on his first day, taught him how to ride a bike, and helped him with his homework. When bullies targeted him in middle school for being smaller than other kids, I was the one who stood up for him. We shared a room until I left for college, and even then, we talked almost every day. The defining moment in our relationship came when Tom was 16. He was acting strange for months, barely eating, and looking constantly worried. One night, he came to my room crying and told me he was gay. He was terrified our parents would kick him out or stop loving him. I hugged him and promised everything would be okay. I helped him plan how to tell our parents, and when he did, I stood right beside him. Our parents were shocked at first, they're not exactly progressive, but they came around after a few months of adjustment. Mom later told me that seeing how I supported Tom helped them accept it. I met Sarah, 31F, during my sophomore year of college. She was studying business while I was engineering. We started dating after being paired for a project in an elective class we both took. She was brilliant, funny, and got along great with my family. Tom especially adored her. When Sarah and I got married after graduation, Tom was my best man. His speech at our wedding made everyone cry. He talked about how I was his hero and how happy he was to see me with someone who made me so happy. The first few years of marriage were perfect. Sarah and I both found good jobs in the city, bought a small house, and started planning for our future. We wanted to wait a few years before having kids, focusing on our careers first. Tom moved to the same city after finishing college and would come over for dinner at least twice a week. Sarah and he became close friends, which made me happy. They would go shopping together, have coffee dates, and Tom would help Sarah plan surprises for me. I never thought twice about their closeness. Tom was gay, and Sarah was my wife. They were the two most important people in my life. Everything started changing about three years ago. Sarah began staying late at work more often, saying she had important projects. She became protective of her phone, always keeping it face down and taking calls in another room. When I asked if everything was okay, she said she was just stressed about work. I believed her because she had recently gotten a promotion with more responsibilities. Tom's behavior changed too. He stopped coming over as much, always having excuses about being busy or not feeling well. When he did come over, things felt tense. I noticed he avoided making eye contact with me, and conversations felt forced. I asked him several times if something was wrong, but he insisted everything was fine. The bomb dropped when Sarah asked for a divorce. She said she had fallen out of love with me and needed space to find herself. I was devastated but tried to be understanding. We had been together for almost ten years, and I couldn't force her to stay if she wasn't happy. The divorce was surprisingly smooth. She didn't ask for much, just took her personal belongings and some furniture we had bought together. Tom was oddly distant during the divorce. He barely offered any support and stopped answering my calls regularly. When I needed my brother the most, he wasn't there. He moved to a different state shortly after Sarah did, claiming he got a better job offer. I was hurt but focused on rebuilding my life. I threw myself into work, got promoted to project manager, bought a new house in a better neighborhood, and eventually started dating again. I met Emily, 30F, at a friend's barbecue last year. She's a pediatric nurse and one of the most compassionate people I've ever met. She helped me trust again and showed me that what happened with Sarah wasn't my fault. We've been together for eight months now, and things are going great. Last week changed everything. I received an email from Jane, who used to work with Sarah. 
The subject line was you deserve to know the truth. Jane explained that she had been carrying this guilt for years, but after recently running into Sarah and Tom together, she couldn't keep quiet anymore. She revealed that Sarah and Tom had been having an affair for over a year before the divorce. The email included dozens of pictures of them together, at restaurants, hotels, even on trips they had taken while telling me they were somewhere else. There were screenshots of their text conversations, some dating back to when Sarah and I were still married. The worst was a video someone had taken outside a restaurant, showing them kissing and laughing. I called Tom immediately. He answered on the third ring, and when I confronted him, he broke down. Between sobs, he admitted everything. He claimed he and Sarah hadn't planned it, that they developed feelings while spending time together. He said they tried to fight it but couldn't. They've been living together in Boston since the divorce, building their life while I was trying to piece mine back together. Yesterday, our parents called. Tom was in a serious car accident and needs emergency surgery on his spine. Their insurance will only cover part of it, and they're asking me to help with the rest since I'm doing well financially. When I refused, they kept pushing until I told them everything. They were shocked silent for a full minute before Mom started crying. Now they're begging me to put aside. My feelings because Tom might end up paralyzed without the surgery. But all I can think about is how he paralyzed me emotionally when he betrayed me with my wife. My parents think I'm being cruel and that family should come first, no matter what. Emily understands why I'm refusing but gently suggested I might regret it later when I'm less angry. I don't think I will. Every time I consider helping, I remember those pictures and messages, and my heart hardens again. Ida? Update 1, two weeks later, the past two weeks have been absolute hell. After I refused to help with Tom's medical bills, word spread through the family like wildfire. My phone hasn't stopped buzzing with messages and calls from relatives I haven't spoken to in years. My Aunt Linda, who didn't even come to my wedding because it was too far to drive, called me five times yesterday alone. She said I was acting like a monster and that mom hasn't stopped crying since I refused to help. Uncle Steve, who borrowed money from me last year and never paid it back, had the audacity to lecture me about family obligations. He said Tom might never walk again without the surgery and asked how I could live with myself knowing I could have helped. My cousin Mark, who I used to be close with, sent me a long text about how disappointed he is in me and how I've changed. The irony is that none of these people offer to help with the medical bills themselves. What makes this situation even more infuriating is what Tom and Sarah have been doing on social media. Last week, Sarah posted a 10-paragraph story on Facebook about their journey to true love. She wrote about how they tried to deny their feelings because of their loyalty to me, but their connection was too strong to ignore. She claimed they never acted on their feelings until after the divorce was finalized, painting themselves as these noble people who did everything the right way. The post included pictures of them together, including one from my wedding day where they were standing next to each other in the wedding party. Sarah wrote under it, looking back, I think our hearts knew even then. My own wedding photos are being used to romanticize their affair. Tom shared her post, adding his own comments about how love doesn't follow conventional rules and sometimes you have to follow your heart even if it hurts people you care about. Their posts have gotten hundreds of likes and supportive comments. People we've known for years, friends from college, former co-workers, even some of my cousins, are congratulating them. Sarah's sister, who used to call me her favorite brother-in-law, commented, Love always finds a way. Someone I thought was my friend wrote, Sometimes the heart wants what it wants. So happy you both found your truth. I couldn't stop myself from reading the comments, each one feeling like a fresh betrayal. These people saw how destroyed I was after the divorce. Some of them helped me move out of my house, listened to me cry over beers, and promised they were there for me. Now they're celebrating the people who caused that pain. Yesterday took an even darker turn when my parents showed up unannounced at my house. Mom was carrying a box of old family photos and home videos. They sat in my living room for two hours, showing me pictures of Tom and me growing up. 
There was one from when Tom was five and had fallen off his bike. I was helping him up and wiping his tears. Another from his high school graduation, where I was hugging him with the biggest proud smile. Mom kept saying, this is who you are. You've always protected him. Dad, who I've never seen cry before, had tears in his eyes as he explained their financial situation. They tried to remortgage their house, but were rejected because they're both close to retirement age. They've already maxed out their credit cards and borrowed money from their friends. The surgery costs more than they can possibly gather, and without it, Tom might never walk again. The doctors are saying the longer they wait, the worse his chances get. I showed them the evidence Jane sent me. The timestamps on the messages proved Tom and Sarah were sleeping together while living in my house, eating at my table, spending the holidays with me. I showed them messages where they planned their meetups, joking about how oblivious I was. There was one particularly painful exchange where Sarah told Tom she felt guilty, and he replied, what he doesn't know won't hurt him. Besides, I know how to keep my brother distracted. My parents were horrified reading the messages, but they still think I should help. Mom said through tears that what Tom did was unforgivable, but letting him suffer won't undo the pain he caused me. Dad suggested I could help with the surgery, but make it clear that I want nothing to do with Tom afterward. They promised they would pay me back eventually, though we all know that's unlikely given their financial situation. Emily has been incredibly supportive through all of this, but last night she asked me to really think about my decision. She said she understands my anger, she'd probably never forgive her sister if she did something similar. But she's worried that if something happens to Tom, I might carry that guilt forever. She suggested I could help save his ability to walk without forgiving his betrayal. But every time I consider helping, I remember those messages. I think about how they laugh behind my back, how they turned our entire family history into a joke. Tom wasn't just my brother, he was my best friend, my responsibility, someone I would have done anything for. He took that trust and used it to destroy my marriage and humiliate me. Now he needs my help, and a part of me wants him to suffer like I did. Does that make me a monster? Maybe. But I'd rather be a monster than a doormat. Update 2 one month later, just when I thought this situation couldn't get more twisted, life found a way to prove me wrong. Last week, I was at work when I received a certified letter from a law firm representing Tom. The contents of the letter made my blood run cold. Apparently, back when Tom first came out and was afraid our parents might react badly, he had named me as his he never changed it, even after everything he did. The hospital needs immediate decisions about his treatment plan. There are risks involved with the surgery that could leave him partially paralyzed if something goes wrong, and legally, I'm the one who has to make these decisions. The irony of this situation isn't lost on me. The brother who betrayed me is now legally dependent on me to make choices about his future. I immediately contacted a lawyer. He explained that while I can resign as Tom's medical proxy, it's not an instant process. The paperwork needs to be filed with the court, and given the urgency of Tom's condition, the timing is problematic. Sarah tried to claim authority as his long-term partner, but since they're not married and Tom never gave her power of attorney, she has no legal standing. The hospital's legal team has been calling me daily. They need decisions about the type of surgery, the approach they'll take, and the risks we're willing to accept. Every time my phone rings, my stomach turns. How am I supposed to make medical decisions for someone I can barely think about without feeling sick? But the situation got even worse yesterday. Jane reached out again, saying she found something while cleaning out her old work computer. She had kept copies of emails from the company server before leaving her job, and what she found made me physically ill. There were email exchanges between Tom and Sarah dating back to before my wedding. They had been seeing each other for over three years, not just one like they claimed. The emails were detailed and graphic. They talked about meetups in hotel rooms while I was at work. They discussed their feelings and future plans. The worst was an email thread from two. Days before my wedding. Tom wrote about considering objecting during the ceremony, but decided against it because he wasn't ready to deal with the fallout. Sarah replied that they needed to be patient and careful. 
They turned my wedding day into part of their sick love story. I haven't told my parents about these new emails. They've already taken out loans from predatory lenders to cover some of Tom's initial medical expenses. Dad, who was always so careful with money, borrowed from one of those payday loan places with ridiculous interest rates. They're draining their retirement savings because of Tom's actions, and I'm angry about that too. They worked hard their whole lives to save that money, and now it's being eaten up by interest rates they can't afford. Sarah has been trying to reach me through mutual friends. She claims she can explain everything and that I don't have the full story. One of her friends told me Sarah cries every night about the situation, as if her tears mean anything to me now. Tom apparently asks about me whenever he's conscious, wanting to know if I've changed my mind about helping. The doctors have him on pain medication, so he's in and out of lucidity. Emily suggested I talk to someone about all this, not a therapist, just someone neutral who might understand the situation. I ended up having coffee with my old college roommate, who went through something similar with his sister. He said something that stuck with me, sometimes the hardest decisions are between what's right and what's right. I'm still trying to figure out what that means for my situation. The hospital needs my decision by the end of the week. I can either sign off on the surgery and potentially save Tom from paralysis, resign as his medical proxy and wash my hands of the whole situation, or remain in this legal limbo while decisions about his care get delayed. Every option feels wrong somehow. My lawyer says resigning as medical proxy might open me up to legal issues since. I knew about Tom's condition and deliberately delayed care. But signing off on the surgery feels like letting them win again. They betrayed me, humiliated me, and now they need my help. The rational part of my brain says I should just sign the papers and be done with it. But every time I pick up the pen, I remember those emails, and my hand won't move. Update 3, 3 months later, after much consideration and legal advice, I resigned as Tom's medical proxy. The process was complicated, but my lawyers helped expedite it given the medical emergency. Our parents took over after proving Tom was financially dependent on them. The surgery happened two weeks after I signed the resignation papers. Tom survived, but will need extensive physical therapy for at least a year. Sarah started a GoFundMe campaign for his medical expenses. The page features their love story complete with carefully selected photos and a narrative that completely erases their betrayal. She wrote about how they found each other against all odds and are now facing this devastating medical crisis. The campaign has raised over $50,000 because people don't know the truth about their affair. Some of my own relatives have donated and shared the campaign, which feels like another slap in the face. My parents took out a second mortgage on their house to cover the remaining medical bills. They sold their vacation cabin, the one they bought 30 years ago and where we spent every summer growing up. Dad had to postpone his retirement and took a part-time job on weekends. Every time I think about how Tom's actions have destroyed our parents' retirement plans, I get angry all over again. I've accepted a job offer in Colorado. Emily and I are moving next month. We got engaged last week, and we both agreed that starting fresh somewhere else is what we need. She's already found a position at a children's hospital there, and my company has an office in Denver. We bought a house in a quiet neighborhood, far from all this drama. The hardest part was telling my parents about the move. Mom cried again, saying the family was falling apart. She begged me to reconsider, arguing that Tom would be starting physical therapy soon and might need my help. I had to remind her that I haven't been part of Tom's life since I discovered his betrayal, and I don't plan to change that. Last week, I received an invitation in the mail. Tom and Sarah are planning to get married once he completes his initial physical therapy. The invitation came with a four-page handwritten letter, apologizing for everything and asking for reconciliation. They wrote about how his accident made them realize the importance of family and how they hope I can find it in my heart to forgive them. They even offered to postpone the wedding if I needed more time to process everything. I threw both the invitation and the letter in the shredder. Emily asked if I was sure about not even keeping the letter, but some things don't deserve to be preserved. I blocked Sarah's number after she tried calling me about the invitation. 
I also blocked her on all social media platforms where she wasn't already blocked. My relationship with my parents is complicated now. I still talk to them once a week, but our conversations are superficial. They know not to mention Tom or Sarah, and I don't ask about them. Mom still sends me updates about Tom's recovery, but I've started leaving those messages unread. The only silver lining in all of this is that I've learned who my real friends are. The ones who stuck by me through everything are helping us plan our move to Colorado. They understand why I need to leave and start fresh. I've realized that sometimes the healthiest thing you can do is walk away, even from family. Some betrayals cut too deep to heal, and some relationships aren't worth saving. Tom and Sarah can live their life together, but they'll have to do it without me in it. I'm focused on building my future with Emily now, and I'm finally starting to feel at peace with my decision to leave everything else behind.